Palestinians uh, applying sanctification um, to life. It looks like it lost the O out of there anyway. So I guess you can figure it out um, from there what I'm going to be doing. Uh, dropped it. But just to, uh, we're going to do a little bit different. Mention a prayer question. We'll wait to the end. Um, we just have a new friend that we want to put. Of course, the bike rally. We're going to be going up there. Pray for us to be able to witness up there to the folks. And uh, with this storm up here, hopefully it doesn't put out the electricity and you don't hear the banging uh, that's going on out there. But we saw Amber and Carl, Payne, Carl uh, Hausman's going to be traveling home this next week on Thursday. So remember him. Uh, ladies, Barb, Ursula, uh, Carol, Sue, Marlene, Goldie, Diana, Diane, Annie, um, Bill, um, and Artie and Wendy, uh, Mita Ray, uh, Pam, uh, Randy, Sean for uh, Salvation, Kate, Caitlin for uh, Medical, uh, Tucker for his um, uh, staff infection. It's getting uh, their upcoming... Um, Weddings that we have, we just got that virus and that's coming about. And of course, I mentioned the bike rally and then Naya, we need to pray for her too. So we're going to do those at the end, change things up a little bit, and go ahead and get started in applying uh, sanctification to our lives. As I mentioned up there, it left out the O because I had to back it up and I didn't put it back in there. The first Thessalonians is 4, 1 through 12. Um, Paul is, um, you know, it, it's really appealing for uh, purity. Now, he, he begins uh, chapter 4. Uh, he's going to tell us Christians um, how, we should, how we should live. Sanctification is a process. It's a daily process of all, all, all the role of our lives. So Paul here is telling the people how to apply sanctification uh, mainly to their, uh, to their sexual lives, what was going on around there, uh, uh, the sexual morality was going around the, the temples and all that was happening about that time. Uh, they had temple prostitutes. There were over a thousand of them in probably every temple that was there. Um, I'll mention a little bit later, but it, it, it was a way of life. And what they did and they used it, so they had to break for some of these habits. So Paul is really um, trying to do that um, for the sanctuary of their uh, sexual life, their social life, their business life. Um, so we're going to study really kind of sanctification this evening. And what does it mean? It means separated or set apart unto God, which we are. Um, it does not mean to do, you put on a false face and presenting a holy front and presenting some kind of a false whitewash of your life to appear to the world that, that you, you are um, sanctified, if I want to say it that way, or you're, you're, um, you're a Christian. Uh, there are some people who think you need to walk differently, yeah, with a Bible underneath your arm, um, and, and never smile, uh, and they think that's really sanctification. But that's that's not really true because Jesus was a happy person. And he wants us. He says, "I give you my joy, not as the world, but my joy." And I'm, I'm sure Jesus laughed. Um, he gave us that ability to do that, so I'm sure he did. But you know, there's always a danger of Christians thinking they have no further need. Uh, to progress in sanctification. They think, okay, I'm once saved. I accepted Christ as my personal Savior. I went to the cross. I believe that he that he died for my sins. He was buried. He rose on the third day. Um, and he sits at the right hand of God. Every, they say, well, I believe that, okay. Uh, but, um, and, and they think, well, that's all you need. You know, uh, kind of some people, just you know, once saved, always saved, so I can just sit back and kind of do what I want. But that's not true. Um, because, you know, this side of eternity, folks, no believer, I don't care who they are, has ever come close to what God desires uh, for, their, for them spiritually. In Philippians 3, uh, 12 through 16. Even though the Thessalonian um, church was a new church, uh, it knew the truth, it, it, it had a lot of positive, it was strong, uh, they were going through persecution and getting through it, they, um, they may have even thought, well, you know, uh, they've been tempted several, several times, uh, and said, well, we rejected this, the spiritual status quo, so maybe we're okay. Um, thanks to Paul, uh, his solid instruction, they were living exemplary lives, and he commended them for it, but because of that, they might have thought that their condition was ideal and they didn't need anything or any more improvement. They made it. You know, we are not going to do anything wrong. But Paul knew um, they could uh, do better. He knew they could, they, they could do better, and he encouraged them 
uh, accordingly. Uh, Paul didn't do it harshly. He didn't beat Adam. He, he, he did it e easily uh, as one who loved them, as that he came to them. In Philippians 3, 12 through 14, it says, Not that I have, this is Paul, already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay old, uh, hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. In other words, Paul is struggling with it. He hasn't, made, he hasn't reached there yet. And remember, Paul says, I do what I don't want to do, and I, and I try to do what I want to do. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. And then we'll forgive, forgive our past. past. Let's forget about that. Let, let's start forward. Let, let, let's start moving forward. The past is the past. We cannot do anything about it. We just ask God for forgiveness, and we come to our life, so let's press on forward, okay? That mistake we made five minutes ago, none of them would we do about it. It's done. Uh, it is what it is, okay? I press on towards the gold for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We, we just press on. We, we put it behind us, and we keep trying to move on and on and try to uh, become more like Christ each day. Um, in verse 1, uh, furthermore, we have beseeched you, brethren, and exhorted you by the Lord Jesus, that ye, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk or live and to please God, so you would abound more and more. Uh, to walk in a pleasing way, Paul says. And to walk in a pleasing way refers to sanctification. It's the only way we're going to get there is we're going to be sanctified each day, listening to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit guiding us and showing us what's wrong and, and changing things and making us right with God. He's sanctifying us. So let, let's look just for a moment at the doctrine of the truth or doctrine of, of sanctification. Um, it's divided really almost into three parts. We have personal sanctification, one. This happens when you accept the Lord as your personal Savior. The moment you believe in Jesus Christ, you enter into union with Him. The Bible talks about being in Christ. That is your position. The righteousness of Christ is imputed to you, and you get His Spirit in you. We call it the Holy Spirit. Paul calls it the Spirit of Christ. He comes and lives in us. That is our position. Now, you may not live up to it. You may not deserve it. You may not produce fruit. That is worthy of it, but that is your position. Christ was sanctified; He was satisfied and satisfied, sanctified, set apart. And the proof of this is in His resurrection and ascension to sit at the right hand of God. When we are saved, as I said, and He comes into our lives, and we we occupy His Spirit, which we call which is called positional sanctification. You never lose this position; it is always there. When God looks at you, he sees, uh, one thing pastor told me years ago, to tell, he sees the blood of Christ. And so, you, so he doesn't see your sin. You're sanctified in him. And so he looks or he sees Christ. You never lose that. Now, I'm not going to say you're worthy of it or you will ever be up to it in this lifetime. We may do our best, but that's not enough. But when you are saved, you are sanctified. Christ's Spirit is imputed, as I said, to you and lives in you and gives you the power and the ability to be sanctified every day through His Spirit. We have practical sanctification. What does that mean? It means every moment you live in fellowship with the Lord, then you are practically sanctified. In experiencing, we're talking about experience, when you are filled, controlled by the Holy Spirit, which is the goal of every Christian to live our lives controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's practical sanctification. Now, do we hold up to that? No. And that guy drives by you and uh, like, like the bikes are here, pulls in front of you and you get mad and you say a few things, well, you didn't we're really sanctified. Or you had that bad thought. Okay. Or you did something wrong. So that, that's hard to do, but that's practical sanctification being filled with the Spirit. But we don't live up to that in this life. We don't through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the we have the ability to do it, but that human fallen nature uh, just keeps poking at us, and we stumble. Don't put Christians on pedestals because we all stumble, some way or the other. We stumble and just leave it that. So we have a hard time with that, but that's what that is. Ultimate sanctification. This is the goal. This is when 
This is what happens on the day Christ will strip of us all of our sinful nature and all of our human good. 1 John 3, 1 through 2, and Philippians 3, 21. We will be like him, completely sanctified. That's when we get to heaven. When we get to heaven, and we're there, all that's stripped away from us. We won't have that old sin nature. We will finally be ultimately sacrificed, sanctified, which another word for that is glorification. Okay? That's what happens there, too. We're finally glorified. We won't have that problem anymore. Okay? So it says, it says there, furthermore, which goes back, finally, brethren, in the Lord, uh, in the Lord, sanctified. Now, how do we walk every day in this, in this process? To walk and please God, to live in a way that's pleasing to God, there is um, no vacation time, folks. There's not a vacation time in this, in the Christian life. You belong to Jesus Christ, and you live it 24 hours a day. People know that you're a Christian. They're going to look at you, and they're going to put you on pedestals. They're going to say you should be acting a certain way. You live it 24 hours a day, and we need to realize that. And we need, when we have thoughts come in and talking to a guy today, uh, we went, went up and did some shooting. He did some sighting of some weapons, and he was talking about, you know, uh, we do that, and, and we are around people sometimes that use language and everything like that. And sometimes that language word gets in their mind. I know when I worked and, and around guys that used it, and, and when I would see that person, that word would pop in my mind. I'd have to charge it and get rid of it and not say it. That's what we have to do every day. 24 hours a day, we have to be on a watch. So we don't, because when we stumble, we hurt the testimony of Christ and our testimony. Paul's priority for Christians was spiritual progress, motivated by a desire to know God. The kind of strong desire the psalmist described. As a deer panteth for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. Psalms 42.1. That's what we should be. For Christians, the pursuit of knowing God is the basic component of spiritual growth or sanctification. I'm just going to give you a couple of scriptures. Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24. 2 Corinthians 8, uh, 7. Ephesians 4, 13. And, and there's a bunch of them. I, I'm just not going to sit here and quote them all off. But the verse says, In the Lord Jesus. You see, only a regenerated or saved person possesses the spiritual power and insight to accomplish spiritual growth. A non-believer can't do that. Only a believer can. You possess the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, and He gives you the ability, if you want to call it a power, the ability. I mean, in the Greek, the, words, the word means dynamite. So we have that and we have the power to do it. Paul's prayer. Listen Paul's prayer. May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another. First Thessalonians 3.12. The only way to love or any other Christian's virtues, any other Christian virtue, can increase is when the Lord causes it to happen. The power comes from the indwelling Spirit of Christ. John 17, 23, Galatians 2, 20, Ephesians 3, 17, Ephesians 4, 15 through 16, etc. To please God literally, to strive to please Him in everything, in our marriages, in our families, in our evangelism, uh, in our work, in our everyday activities, in all the avenues of service we do for the Lord, we should always strive to please God. It says in verse 2, For you know what commands we gave you by the Lord Jesus. See, Paul's been here, he's been teaching the Thessalonians, and they knew spiritual growth, folks, is not instantaneously. Now, he may take certain sins away from us right away. Other ones, like on me and others, he worked on them and got them away from us eventually. But it is not instantaneous. You don't wake up in the morning, overnight, and you're sanctified. Okay? Spiritual excellence is a lifelong process or commitment. As we walk in our daily obedience, we gradually become more and more like Jesus. Paul's exhortation of the Thessalonians was a confirmation of that fact and a reminder to keep growing just as they already actually did walk. Uh, you know, I go to a group on Saturdays and a lot of the guys are homeless and some of them have been addicts of different alcohol, drugs. 
And, and there's one guy, I'm not going to give you a name because I, I just don't want to, mm -hmm. but he is such a neat guy. And he handed me what he does every day. And you know what part of his testimony is? He says, when I don't do this every day, my day is a mess. He calls it Ram, I think, or Ram. And today when I saw him, it, it, I haven't been there very long. He gave me a hug today. He's just a neat guy. But he has to do that. You see, it's a commitment. He wants to do what the Lord wants him to do. He wants to walk worthy. Uh, and he did. And, and the Thessalonians were acting. We're walking right. Man, they were witnessing. They were going down to the docks. They were doing everything. They were upholding, witnessing to everybody. For the persecution wasn't getting to them. They were doing it. And Paul rec recommended them for it. They were on the pathway of growing uh, of sanctification. And Paul wanted them to stay on that path. And so we encourage this man, everybody we deal with on, on Saturday, these, these ones that are coming up, that we encourage them to read the Word of God, get into a group of men. That's why I, I go to men on Sunday and Saturday, and, and we're, we, we do some shooting, and, and we may do an overnight thing um, if Richard gets it together, which it seems like it's going to. We need that fellowship. We need the people to help us to stay on the path, to have a determined mindset of the long-distance runner or boxer as Paul describes what First Corinthians nine twenty four, uh, seventeen. And I don't buy. I don't. I don't box the air out of nothing. I got a. I got a purpose to it, and we're in it for the long run. It, it isn't just salvation today, and, and that's it. It's for the long run, for the rest of our lives. You see, we're working for that. Paul says we have to be that long distance runner. We got that boxer and box the air right, not just flailing around out there. What are we going to do? How are we going to do this? How are we going to fight Satan's temptations? With the Word of God. We talked about that today. With the Word of God. We hear all this stuff going on on our side. we got to take it and filter it through the Word of God. That's how we do that. You see, Paul says it's the will of God in verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from... And here's Paul gets into fornication. For the Thessalonians... Um, then sexual sin was really more customary and more tolerated in his day than, than it even is today. In today's standards, it was more tolerated. As I mentioned, what was going on back then, like I say, they had most of them, and most of the times I read about it in some of the temples, the temples they had around there, and Diana, and all this, and Artemis, they had over a thousand prostitutes. And so they would go in, and, and they would do all this stuff because it was a spiritual thing. So it was around there. It was even more acceptable back then than it is even today. Even to today, it's got very acceptable, you see. But it was a mess back then, even. There's, there's nothing new, even what's going on in our society today. There was debauchery and everything else, and I'm not going to go in, into all that. And the churches in Revelation, when I do on Wednesday, a lot of that was happening there, too. So these churches were in environments, and they were in habitable living under these things and doing these things that they had to break these habits. You see, since the 1960s, when the modern sexual revolution really accelerated in the Western society, it has further and further no rules, further and further uh, and it rules governing sexual behavior and attitudes. It has in many ways become the cultural God that rules over all the idolatrous gods in our society, in our postmodern culture. It has just taken over everything. And it has fewer and fewer rules. Except for maybe child molestation that you don't still do. It's just about anything goes in our society today. And it's acceptable in our society today. There are several reasons uh, for the world's immoral, uh, unscriptural outlook on sex. One, people are basically good and all be, it's okay, the activities should be tolerated. All the highness activities should, should be tolerated. tolerated. So, so any kind of casual sex activity is good, except, as I said, child molestation. Sex is merely a personal gratification. Two, sexual activity is only a biological function, 1 Corinthians 6.13. It is a natural function and necessary to engage without any moral restrictions. 
What they're trying to tell you, really, is we're just like animals, and we can't keep away from it, so do it. Okay. Three, casual sex is just another form, and you think this is new. I can tell you way back in the 80s, when I first came back out here and retired from the Air Force, the early 80s, this is, this is what a physical education teacher told a pastor's son. Okay. Casual sex is just another form of fun and pleasure with any consulting partner. Four, fulfilling one's sexual desire is a goal life. It's a goal in life more important than developing meaningful relationships. Therefore, the beginning of every romantic relationship should include sex. The sanctification process is the, is the direct result of salvation. As Paul indicated to the Corinthians, such sexual immorality were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians 6.11 you see, in view of the permissive culture in Thessalonica, just like I mentioned, even us here in the United States today, and really all through the world, Paul considered abstention from sexual immorality to be the first priority in their devotion to sanctification. He was concerned that the Thessalonians could easily fall back into their formal habits. Like I say, it was a habit of life. It was normal. It was customary. It was acceptable. It was habitable. And he did, he did not want them to fall back in that, so that was the first thing he had to get them to get away from. And Paul got this from God. Paul's teaching on sexual uh, morality is strict and demanding and extends beyond just physical acts, as in his letters teaching to the Ephesians and the Colossians. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as in proper as is proper among saints. Excuse me, Ephesians five three. Goes on in Colossians three, uh, three and verse five. For you have died and you and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to. Immorality, impurity, passions, evil desires, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Total abstinence from sexual sin is the duty of the most importance for all believers. Exodus 20, 14, Acts 15, 20, Romans 13, 13, 1 Corinthians 6, 15, 18, Galatians 5, 19 through 21, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, and etc. goes on. Say, Christians living together is a contradiction. I know it falls under those other categories I just gave you, but it's a contradiction. Christians should not be, that's the first thing, abstaining from that. How can a Christian be sexually moral? Well, verses 4 through 6a really do it. Because Christians today are exposed to all kinds of sights and philosophies that tempt their fallen flesh to immoral thoughts and actions. I mean, look how look look how some of the women walk around today in those pants and the shorts and things. I mean, it's just there. It's all out there. Even TV. TV's not the same. Look what happens on TV. We have it's all around us. The sights, the sounds. Uh, the philosophies that, that that tempt us, and I just read through some of those philosophies. Uh, thoughts saying they uh, we must know how to resist such temptations. And one one see the body should not control the believer. It shouldn't control the believer. In verse four, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Now sometimes the possession of vessel uh, people used to talk about this being the wife. But when you look in the context of the passage, which you always have to look in the context of the passage, the context of the passage is not talking about your wife, it's talking about you as an individual. It means to possess or control your own body. Christians have to control their appetite, their bodily appetites. Every Christian needs to know themselves well enough to understand their weaknesses and thereby know how to possess, master their own, his own vessel. 
I know as teenagers, it's hard, and we go through these things. But let's put this one. Some of the guys we deal with have uh, pornography problems. And there, there's there's a lot of preachers that have, too, in, in counseling. That you're okay? So if they have it, they're just like that guy that, that's an alcoholic. You can't go out there and pick that up again. You do, you're going to find yourself thinking about it and going about it again. Just like guys I know they will not walk by that bar. They cannot associate with the people. They cannot go in there. Well, the same thing is with that. You have to know your limitations and stay away from it. If that bothers you, then don't watch it. Get away from it. Okay? You, do, you have to know it, and you have to possess your own vessel. Today's culture, and in Paul's culture, the, uh, uh, operated largely according to physical appetites. <laughs> we do today. And impulses and superficial emotions. Yeah, remember... One of the slogans way back, and it's probably today too, the slogan is, if it feels right, do it. It's of the contemporary origin, but the philosophy it, uh, that, uh, that expresses is not. That's why Paul gave such strong instruction. It isn't if you feel good, do it. Paul, in several of his other letters, made it clear that in order to control their bodies, believers, believers must, must rely on the Holy Spirit. He gives you the ability, he gives you the power to say no. It says, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Galatians 5.16 The key to walking in the Spirit, folks, is being filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.17-18 Being filled with the Spirit is for believers to let the Word of God dwell in them. Corinthians 3.16, I forgot. I think that's 1 Corinthians, maybe 2nd. So we must sincerely read, study, and apply Scripture so it saturates our lives and then allows us to yield control to the Holy Spirit and He can give us the ability to get out of it. And I tell you, He can, and He does. When you do, I can tell you all kinds of times the bell just goes off. Says Wayne, don't go there. Don't do this. Don't go over there. He does, and he warns us about those things. And that's all we have to do. That's in Deuteronomy six seven, Psalms one two one nineteen ninety seven, John five thirty nine, Acts seventeen eleven, uh, chapter twenty verse thirty two, Romans fifteen uh, four, First Peter two twelve, and we just go on. There's just too many scriptures. You see, the goal is positive. Pursue separation and virtue with all your heart. No Christian should ever ask how far their moral behavior can depart from God's standard and still avoid sin. Richard and I were talking about that coming back from uh, sighting some guns in. We should never get on that line. We should not be standing on that line just, 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 just trying to put that foot right over that line and just see how far we can go. No. We should never do that. We should rather strive to be separate from immorality so we can honor our bodies which belongs to God and use them to glorify Christ the head of the church. Ephesians 1 22 21 through 23, chapter 2, 20 through 21, chapter 4, 15 through 16, Colossians 1, 18 through 24. Believers should not act like unbelievers, number 2. Verse 5, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. That's the second principle Paul gives us. With the day the Thessalonians were not to behave like their pagan neighbors and relatives. Pressure. Peer pressure. Oh, we never heard of peer pressure, right? Remember high school? But you get peer pressure today, even as adults. In our work environments and everywhere else we are, there are peer pressures for us. And, and we get those things. We still have peer pressures. Okay. But we shouldn't be like those relatives of peer pressure who do not know God. We were not transformed by by the divine work of salvation. We were transformed by the divine work of salvation. We're transformed by that. God has transformed us to be different. Not to conform to the pressure of society. And it's out there to do that. We are told to accept certain lifestyles. We're told to do this. 
And we must not accept that, especially in the church. Folks, we should not be accepting abortion, same-sex marriages, and all that in our churches. No way. We should not be doing that at all. That's against God's word. But we're pressured to do that. And we should not do that. We're just, we're, we were transformed by the divine work of salvation through Jesus Christ. It's a mental attitude, really. Christians must not, we must not lower, we must not lower, uh, Christians should not lower themselves to a level of pagan sexual behavior determined by unthinking passions and uncontrollable fleshly urges. Passions means uncontrollable desires, compelling feelings, overpowering urges. And because of our intimate relationship with, with a holy God, we must subject ourselves, we must not, excuse me, subject ourselves to an unholy society's vast array of sexual immoral temptations. 2 Timothy 2.22, 1 John 2.15-16. Over exposure to such temptations will only lower your resistance and weakening spiritual resolve. I can tell you, if you're around a lot of that, or you're watching a lot of this stuff, if you're around a lot of people that are using not the right language and everything like that, I can tell you because I just mentioned it, working around a lot of people that, 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 that talked like that, that word would enter my head and I would have to put it out. You, you become weak about it, and you never know. Sometimes it slips out. You see, you got to be very cautious, you see. And if we're around and, and looking at a lot of that stuff, uh, that stuff can cause us those stuff. Lustful thoughts and feelings can, can lead Christians to actions not compatible with their position in the body of Christ because we're around it a lot. And, and, and it, just, it just breaks down. It, break, it breaks us down. It causes us to be weak. 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 20. Uh, third, believers should not take advantage of others. Uh, verse 6a, and that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter. Third principle that emerges from um, sexual immorality, never, uh, never sexually take advantage of other believers. The word transgress means to sin against, which means stepping over the line. Defraud, it means to selfishly, greedily take something for personal gain and pleasure at someone else's expense. This can be done in the church. This also can be done in a business relationship. Don't take advantage of somebody. Always be honest and always deal honestly. Don't take advantage of them. You see, whenever believers seek to satisfy their own physical desires or gain sexual pleasure at the expense of others, they have violated this command. God considers this subject so serious that Jesus warned. Listen to what Jesus said. Whoever causes one of those little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavily millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because it's stumbling blocks that the world puts in front of us. It's okay to do this. It's okay to do that. It's okay to do this. Right now, uh, don't want to get too much into that. These looters and all getting away with it. It's okay to go steal and, and riot and everything else. How about that? But if you protect, if you protect your business, like one guy, he's, he may go to prison, and another guy is home. You see what I mean? They're putting stumbling blocks in front of us. And, of course, all the immorality that's put into our society today, that everybody says it's okay. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. Matthew 18, 6-7. That's serious stuff. Don't cause people to stumble and get away from Christ. That's serious. Jesus is serious about this. One expects the world to offend believers and sometimes cause them to sin, but believers should never be the stumbling block for fellow believers. Never. Why should, should a Christian be sexually moral? Well, Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, anticipates his readers asking, why should, why should we keep the commandments concerning sexual morality? Because, God's, because of God's vengeance in verse 6b. The first motive, 
that Paul gives the Thessalonians for obeying his commands is to abstain from sexual limitations because the Lord is the avenger in all these things. You see, only God has the right to, ex to extract vengeance for the sins people commit. Okay. Listen, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written... Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord, Romans 12, 19. God's going to do it. See, look, if Christians engage in, in more immoral, immorality or immoral things and defeat, uh, avenge their, their brothers or something and take advantage of them and stuff, God the Avenger may judge all these things by allowing one or more consequences to affect the believer's life. See, let's just give an example. Say severe damage to a marriage, that uh, or a relationship, maybe by loss of respect or or family love, and maybe even leave it lead into the divorce. That 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 can be a consequence of that if we let that go. Matthew five thirty two and nine nineteen nine. God may chasten by allowing a disease, a venereal disease, or maybe a physical affection. That can result in the loss of eternal rewards for a Christian. And maybe you'll never forget it either. Your minds remember everything. And maybe you'll remember it. You won't forget it. It'll pop up. Satan may use it for something else. But it, but it may come back. There's all kinds of consequences. Even mental. You see, the concept of God's judgment against sexual immorality was not new to the Thessalonians. Or to, it should be to us. Paul reminded them that he also told them about it before and solemnly warned them. Paul taught them the whole word or the whole counsel or the whole purpose of God in Acts 20, 27. This is nothing new and it shouldn't be to us today. And because of God's purpose in verse 7, to strive to be sexually moral is in God's general plan, God's will for believers' lives. The second reason for abstaining from sexual was because the command, it fit God's purpose. The phrase in sanctification indicates the believer's positional position of holiness as the result of God's effectual, effectual call. God's purpose in salvation was produced to produce a holy people who walked worthy of the divine call to enter his kingdom and glory. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as the result of works, so that no one will may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before hands so that we would walk in them. That's God's purpose for us. To walk worthy, to be sanctified. The believer. Therefore, sexual sin is inconsistent with God's presence and ultimate purpose for Christians. It's a contradiction. For because of God's Holy Spirit, in verse 8, Paul says, your Disobeying would mean you were rejecting God's Holy Spirit. Wow, that's rough, isn't it? A believer who rejects, nullifies, makes void the command to abstain from sexual immorality is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to them. The practice of sexual sin violates the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It spurns the Lord's will, disregards His purpose, defiles His commands, rejects His love, and abuses His grace. One of the passages in Romans, so we, so we keep on sinning so God's grace abounds, and it says, no, the, harshest, the, the strongest word in Greek, God forbid. We don't keep going. It's abuse of God's grace. So Paul's exhortation to the Thessalonians should prompt all believers to faithfully heed these words and use the means God has given us to abstain from all forms of sexual sin. Romans 13, 13-14, 1 Peter 2, 11. 
need to be sanctified in our social life. So this is the end of verses 9 through 12. Love each other more. Romans 12, 10, Hebrews 13, 1, 1 Peter 1, 22, 22 2 Peter 1, 1, 7. True biblical love is a rec is recurring is a recurring New Testament theme. Always expresses itself in acts of service, meeting needs. It is a verb and doing things sacrificially to benefit others. If we're thinking on others, why would we take advantage of that partner of ours? I don't mean partners in marriage. I mean partners that we're dating with or a guy we like or a girl we like. Why would we take advantage of them? If we really love them, wouldn't we want them to stay pure? Sacrifice that benefit of Matthew 25, 35 through 40, John 13, 34 through 35, Romans 12, 15, etc. I said, love is a verb, it's action. It thinks of the other person before it thinks of itself. It says, lead a quiet life in verse 11. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Well, what it means is to be zealous, um, to make it your ambition, it means to be zealous and strive eagerly, even to consider it an honor, whereas lead a quiet life means to be silent, not speaking out inappropriately, remaining at rest and tranquil. Don't get excited. Relax in Christ. You see, when we get upset and out there, we act inappropriately. How many times have we acted inappropriately, maybe to our spouse or girlfriends or whatever, and we said things, uh-oh, shouldn't have said that. Did that the other day. See, we shouldn't do that. But sometimes that's just us. We fall. In 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 12, Luke 23, verse 56. In anticipation of the Lord's return, believers are to lead peaceful life, free of conflict and hostility towards others as much as possible, which is a witness to the transforming power of the gospel. How about that? Blessed are they who what? Peacemakers. Mind your own business, it says in 11b, and attend to your own business. Paul issued a follow-up exhortation in 2 Thessalonians 3. We'll get to that one too. 11 through 12. For we hear that, among, that some among you are, le are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Uh, one pastor said, it's the, uh, lamb, lamb supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven is going to be great. There's going to be no gossiping. People say, well, that's going to be boring. No, it's going to be great. There will be no gossiping. And that's what this means, busybodies, gossiping, getting in other people's business. Now, such persons were commanded and exhorted in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. Make your own living. And those who did not attend to their own business were acting like busybodies. We need to work. And we need to be, be good workers. You know, Paul's antidote to all of this was to work diligently and faithfully at their jobs with walking the Spirit. Work with your hands in verses 11c through 12. And work with your hands just as we command you so that you behave properly towards outsiders and not be in any need. But it's great word of living uh, is the foundation of all evangelism. Straightforward living, practical living. Believers who, who sacrifice and love one another exhibit quiet lives. They keep the focus on their own lives in order and faithfully carry out their daily responsibilities. In the workplace, all the while proclaiming the gospel in the light of the return of Christ are the most effective witnesses to their unsaved neighbors and loved ones. Be that good worker. And, and, and if you're a boss, be the good boss. But if you work and, and you work right and you do that, I mean, it, when I worked, people wanted to know why I was different than other people. I got to witness to them by being a supervisor and I shut my door. Why are you so different? And other people says, well, you're different than the guy you're sitting next, next to you. Did you hear all this? 
it takes it, it it makes a difference when we're living and being the worker and being the best worker we can that helps our witness to the people around us of course we got to speak too but they see something different in us you see and we're not doing that. We're in our workplace. We are the best workers that, that can be there. We focus on that. And it helps our witness out there. That's what we're to be. Because think about it. God gave you that job. You need a job you prayed for like I did. God gave it to you. You got to be glad about it. Yeah, no job is perfect. And yeah, there probably, there's times that you, you speak up. What I'm talking about is grumbling and griping and getting people together and making a mess and horrible times. and <coughs> You just don't do that. And bosses need to treat their people well. That's what this is talking about. Sanctification in our lives, making our life look like Christ in everything we do. Let me just close and, 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 and just look. If you can't live this life, maybe it's because you don't have the Holy Spirit. Well, maybe you haven't accepted Christ as your personal Savior. Well, first you need to A, accept, to acknowledge Acknowledge that you are a sinner separated from God. You've broken his laws. You don't have a relationship with him. Maybe that's happened to you. You, you need to acknowledge that. Realize that you are a sinner. You've broken God's law. That's all that means. You've broken God's law. Then you need to believe that Jesus came and died on your behalf. Took your sin on that cross. He shed his blood for your sin. He died for your sin. Rose on the third day. Romans tells us that for we believe that in the heart. And then we confess it with the mouth. You have salvation. You have eternal life. For God so loved the world that whoever believes in it shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus says, if you come to me, I will not cast you out if you really do. Eternal life. All through it, eternal life. You just need to come to him. Maybe, maybe you're a Christian, Christian and maybe, maybe you've, you've uh, done some of these things. You know, God, it's in 1 John 1, 9. All you've got to do is confess and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness, that passage says. All unrighteousness make you clean again and so you can have that relationship with him and you can have the power of the Holy Spirit to work in your life again maybe that's what it is because Christians backslide Christians go off I mean it happens I I, I, I was saved young and went off and didn't get really didn't get really back in the church until I was 28 but I did witness in between when I when when Jesus got the opportunity but I didn't go we backed off a little bit got a little worldly that happens to us but he brings us back and maybe you just need to do that. You need to confess that. Say, say, Lord, just, just, just forgive me. I don't need prayers because then that, that's, that's just something that you would say after me. You just do need to do that on a personal. It's yet your personal relationship with Him. I can't save you. Only He can. He's the only one that has the power to save you. It's Him, and you have to ask Him. You have to believe, and you have to ask. So won't you do that if you haven't done that? And if you're not having fellowship with Him that maybe you're caught up in some of these things here, then maybe you just need to ask him and get that fellowship back. Just like David did. And he asked the Lord to restore the joy of the salvation. He committed murder, committed adultery, to restore the joy of my salvation. He even lied. That's what you need to do. Let me pray remember these in prayer. Because Father, again, we just thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. It can be very pointed, Father, as sometimes here it is, and you can really cut deep. But, Father, we just thank you for it. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. All these, the amber and all these that are feeling as physical pain, Father, that are did, uh, with medicines and, uh, Father, recoveries and salvation with, uh, with Randy and, and Sean. And even the guy the other day up, up at the, the rally, he was saved just a day before. Oh, what a gracious thing, Father. And we just, just stop by, just pray for him, pray for his daily growing fathers grow sanctification just help <clears throat> be with him be with all the ministries up there at the rally fathers they witness to the people keep them safe from the storm that was going around here father and just uh, just watch over us father be with our pastors and the churches tomorrow and lord we'd sure like to see this virus go away and father so we pray for that too pray for the men's groups that i go with and uh thank you for them thank you for being willing to do that and lord just uh lord we just love you and we just can't do anything without you. Father, give us the ability to be the, the Christians we need to be. We won't be perfect, but help us to exemplify you as best we can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and be back on Wednesday with uh, the first, uh, at least the first church, maybe the first two churches in Revelation. Have a great weekend, and God bless.